behind me on in the field. Um, you know, something's interesting. I, I usually ask like how musicians got started in music, but what I'm interested to know is that, but also was bass always your instrument? Actually, I started playing clarinet when I was a kid in elementary school, growing up in New York, and I played classical clarinet, and also like concert band, saxophone, nothing too cool. Oh, wow. Um, but I was a really serious reed player as a kid growing up, and then I started playing electric bass in junior high, mm -hmm. and that kind of took over, and then the upright bass in college, and that was when I sort of got into jazz, and that kind of improvising, even though it was like jamming mm -hmm. with guys in basements for mm -hmm. most of my childhood. Wow, Did, was your family musical? Not at all. Oh. They just had classic rock LPs, and that was like, that was the little nudge in the direction of music. And the radio was always on, but nobody played instruments and nobody studied or anything like that. Huh, so yeah. you picked up the clarinet yeah. and later saxophone. Was there something that, that sparked the interest in, in playing an instrument, or was it just something that happened? I think I always just loved music as a kid. I mean, even uh, when I discovered, you know, Cousins' record collections or my parents' record collections or classic rock radio growing up in New York, it was... It just consumed me immediately from the first age where I could put on my own record. I had the little box of 45s I carry around in my Fisher Price record player at all family events when I was like, hot, you know, little, little kid. Funny you mentioned <laughs> so it. So then it was like, oh, I could do this too and not just listen again. That's yeah. right. Well, you mentioned Fisher Price Price record <laughs> set. Um, you know, Alex Rudis was talking about that too when they really? those came out. And he used to be like the, the, the in store kid model yeah. to show how. You oh, know. that's fantastic. <laughs> And I've seen it recently in family videos and pictures. I, there it was, almost every event. You can see the little yellow box of the records I've played for everybody. Wow. So then I guess um, I was lucky enough to grow up when, at a time when public schools had still had a lot of music programs. Mm -hmm. And so in fourth grade, mm -hmm. Mr. Albano looked at my teeth and said, clarinet. <laughs> <laughs> That's how these decisions were made then. Uh, oh, right, yeah, right. Yeah, so I became really serious about that and then wound up you know, getting more into the different kinds of music as I got right. older. Right. So was that, you know, so, so by uh, other music uh, influences, uh, how, how did the bass come in, the change over from reeds to, to bass? I think it was, I love playing all the orchestral music and concert band music, but then once I started to get a more sophisticated sense of who I was as a kid and what I liked to listen to, yeah. I got really into heavy metal, actually, uh -huh. and thrash and punk and hardcore. Mm -hmm. um, it was a great time to be a kid going to all-ages clubs in New York when I was like 13, 14, 15. So I started to just get together with guys, and I wanted to play that kind of music, and it, the alto sax and the clarinet weren't so much. That yeah. I, even though I did try that, I tried to play in like Billy Joel cover bands, and I played in Bruce Springsteen cover bands, and I was always the token saxophonist with the tambourine on the Oh, really? I had no sax, you know. <laughs> but then I took up electric bass and uh, started to really play with guys and play the music that I was really into at that time. Mm -hmm. and, and then the bass, yeah, kind of took over. And then in college, I had the chance to start taking upright lessons, mm -hmm. and that really... Uh, kind of sent me on this derailment of following. <laughs> wow, because you know, going from like, not what I planned. electric to yeah. acoustic, yeah. I hear is a, a pretty a wide gap, right? They're pretty different so. animals, yeah. They're really different, which is why also it's hard to maintain both and play both of them a lot. Mm -hmm. Very few people can like, keep up both of those instruments because they kind of have a different technique and a different, I don't know, this way of expressing yourself, mm -hmm. I think, so. Was there, um, were there were there particular things that you were listening to or or musicians that inspired that 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 addition? Yeah, actually, it was uh, the Mingus Big Band in New York was a huh. huge thing for me. Seeing upright players play that music and where the bass was so critical and functional and mm -hmm. like leading things and such a strong voice in the ensemble and that was kind of an interesting switch too from growing up with like rock music and all this kind of riff based bluesy music. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mingus' music was a really natural sound to me, and that was kind of what opened the door to mm -hmm. jazz in general and the bass, the upright bass in particular, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Wow, so you grew up in, in New York City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to high school in Manhattan and then grew up in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friends and I were just such, we would just consume as much music as we possibly could. We snuck into the Knitting Factory all the time, the original <laughs> one, and we would go to the Time Cafe and see the Mingus Big Band. And I remember it was like a $6 cover on Thursday nights, and they knew we weren't technically allowed there because we were kids, but there was a drink menu, so we would always get the same thing, which was like a cup of coffee and a chocolate brownie that was like $15 to make up for the fact that we couldn't drink, and the, and the waitress would kind of keep an eye on us, like, you know, I know they're not supposed to be here, but they don't try anything, so wow. it was kind of a ritual that we did almost every week for a long time. But you don't really hear stories like that anymore unless, unless someone's in their 70s, so that's interesting yeah. that they were still doing that. 
at that time. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. Yeah, it was nice, and I feel like New York was still a little accessible and rough around the edges in ways that it might not be now for a mm-hmm. kid who's interested in that music. Things have gotten a little more rarefied, and yeah. access is a little more blocked. I think it's, more, it's more expensive. Place. Yeah, right? yeah. But back then, you could kill, still sneak into stuff, <laughs> which was great for my musical education. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so, so, so Mingus, Mingus was definitely a, a heavy influence at the beginning. For sure. And um, were there were there particular musicians that um, you know? Uh, that you got a chance to to hear live or work with that or meet that also had an influence on your, your overall compositional and pro- and uh, performance. Uh, yeah, well, well, early on it was great because I started playing the upright bass when I went to college at the University of Virginia, mm-hmm. and it's just a little tiny town in Charlottesville, but it happens to have a lot of really great jazz musicians who are pretty open-minded, um, who really took me under their wing when I first started playing and. I still remember, I feel like a little bit the instrument chose me in a way because mm-hmm. uh, my second semester of college I decided, okay, I want to take upright lessons and I had one lesson and I learned the F major scale and I learned basically how to hold this bow mm-hmm. and then I went off and the next week I found out there was a jazz festival on the campus and the theme that year was bass masters. So uh-huh. literally a week after my first lesson, Richard Davis, uh, Milt Hinton, Dave Holland, um, Charlie Hayden, they were all on campus doing workshops and clinics and playing these incredible concerts. I saw Charlie Hayden's Liberation Music Orchestra like after my first bass lesson. Wow. And, uh, Milt Hayden played solo and so it was kind of a little bit like, oh, and I got to see the entire span of what that instrument could do, you know, from these masters and they were all very, like, hanging out and very accessible. So a little bit, of, I that was like, oh, I guess that's what I'm doing. <laughs> So inspiring. Yeah, that sounds like quite a moment in time and yeah. fortuitous too. Absolutely ridiculous. And then that the festival never actually happened again the whole time that I was there. That was the last one. <laughs> it was almost like it was there for you. Yeah. <laughs> that was kind of amazing. I don't even know if I fully absorb like I, I fully absorbed what really those guys were even doing, but it was enough mm-hmm. to really get me super inspired and motivated mm-hmm. and I just practiced constantly after that. Yeah. Like that first little injection, you know. Wow. Yeah. And, and were you were you dabbling in the compositional elements as well at the time? Not or? really. Um, well, I always kind of jammed with guys and made up tunes in bands that I was in because mm-hmm. I, I had a lot of bands in high school and college. And mm-hmm. So it was always like I came more from that kind of idea of making music together in a garage or basement. And we didn't write it down even though we could all read music. Mm-hmm. But um, we all just developed riffs and layers of things and transitions the way rock bands kind of work together. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of how I learned to compose. And for me, it was harder to figure out well, how do you do that without people just yourself oh, right. and that's something I kind of had to reverse engineer later because the process of writing music was always so collaborative right. um, coming from that and I, I, would, I would stand you know I would look at I would be at a piano with blank staff paper like oh, okay so now I'm a composer where's everybody else <laughs> but uh, yeah I guess I came from that kind of background so like you know like like uh, word like um, uh, you know call and response passing it on orally in a sense uh, you know an older style of, of composition in, in, in a lot of ways, and, and also a precursor to improvisation, I would yeah, think. Yeah, right? and it's nice, I mean, it's nice to kind of keep that idea of the way a band communicates together, and as a band leader, I think, as a composer now, even though I figured out other ways of writing, um, I'm still interested in that way that a group works together over time, and not composing that out of the picture, and not uh, kind of alienating individuals so that we can't have that group thing together, which is like when I was 14 in a garage, and we would be like, all right, what's the bridge? And then somebody plays something, and someone says, I think I know something that goes, or that sucks, or that kind of feeling like we're all invested is something I still try to kind of get into my group, even if technically I'm the leader. I'm right. really interested in that. Right, so you've I'm always carried that with. with you. Yeah, or I'm still trying to figure out how to keep that, even though I'm a control freak in other ways. <laughs> <laughs> but you've also... Um, you also uh, are quite active with a number of improvisers here locally, um, and I mean that's how I, I met you through the improvised music community. Yeah, yeah. So um, that is definitely part of your your um, your musical adventures. Absolutely, well. absolutely, and I feel like I need to always keep those parallel. I mean, I think I started to want to compose more and lead more because I felt like there was always some itch that wasn't being scratched, just waiting for someone to call you. Like, oh, I'm not doing that kind of playing. Like, there's certain sounds I want to be able to get. And that's really where that came from. Okay. But it hasn't 
taken over in any way that desire to just make something with people in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I feel like those two things always have to kind of be going on or I really miss the other one if one of them takes over too much, mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. So do you remember when um, you started doing m more free improvisation or when, when, when that was more of a, you know, it was a equalized with your compositional? It's a good problem. question. I mean, in a certain way I was doing free improv when I was playing with guys in garages, like when we were just making stuff up together that would later become a tune on a demo or something, right. you know, and then we'd listen back to our jam tapes, we called them jam tapes, <laughs> like obsessively nerdily because that's still the same. Um, but we had like a series of jam tapes that we would put on our Tascam 4 track in the, in the garage or the basement and uh, we'd listen back and then we would just still out, oh that's a cool section, let's learn that, let's see if we can develop that. So in a way composition always came from improvising with people I love to play with. Right. And so, in a certain sense, when I started to really learn jazz with a capital J, hmm. I thought it was really separate from that. And I kind of thought that these two things were totally discrete universes of music. And I think I've been trying to recover from that mindset of thinking of jazz as this other vocabulary, other set of rules, and thinking that they're all part of who I am and my background. And, but for a little while there, I sold all my DRI records to buy Blue Note. CDs and I was like indoctrinated in the way we make jazz and it has nothing to do with the way you make rock and nothing to do with you know your background <laughs> as a kid who jammed you know so I went through that period and I really had to recover from that because I felt like it was making jazz this thing that wasn't as close to my who I was mm -hmm. and so I guess I've been on a path to combine those for a long time now. Yeah I, I hear that quite often within the new music and creative music improvised communities a lot of people go through the same process um, even myself went yeah. through that process so um, and then you come back around full circle yeah and you, you know. kind of want it all it's all part of you and you right. try to figure out a way to connect them you know yeah I mean maybe theoretically it could be that the educational process kind of like had in some ways disconnected jazz from its roots a little bit and uh, and then you know over time we find those yeah those roots it's true and I was lucky enough actually not to go to school for jazz and learn it just from guys who played it great and so, luckily, I didn't have to forget a lot of the things that can happen in an institutionalized environment that can mm -hmm. kind of derail your creativity a little bit. Not for everybody, but I know some people have had that experience feel like they also had to recover from mm -hmm. an indoctrination or something. I was really lucky to come up with really supportive, open-minded people, and it was up to me, really, to figure out how to get all the things to fit together. Right. Um, years later, I learned that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're, um, how do you approach your compositional process? Every project winds up being its own little puzzle that mm -hmm. I create for myself. But I, I definitely, um, I set up these rules or, or world of think questions I want to answer or things or sources of inspiration that get me into a project. And so um, each one winds up being really different. I very rarely just like have an idea for a tune and write it. It's always like something starts to cook up from like a bunch of films I've been watching, or a bunch of books I've been reading, or a certain group of people that are playing a certain way, or mm -hmm. and the ideas start to come first, and then I kind of try to figure out how I map those ideas onto notes and rhythms and relationships. Um, so this noir project that is um, yeah. in the summit this year was really one of these things where I literally came from reading a lot of books and, and starting to feel like they, they sounded like something, and they were tied to places that had sounds connected to them for me. And they brought up really interesting questions about like your relationship to genre and, and literature. That's really a thing, just mm -hmm. as it is with music and wrestling with that and trying to find your way in there. So mm -hmm. sometimes, usually it's like these concepts are floating out in the air. And then the hardest part is, oh my God, I have to actually write notes and give them to people <laughs> because <laughs> all this stuff starts swimming around and it's research and library trips and, mm -hmm. and, uh, field trips and field recordings and all these crazy things I do to kind of get all the things flowing and then mm -hmm. I kind of try to figure out how to get it down. So mm -hmm. yeah. does, do, does, does that evoke melodies in your mind or, or do you approach it from a rhythmic uh, standpoint? It can be all these things. So for yeah. example, for the Noir Project, um, I was looking at two writers, Dashiell Hammett, who kind of was one of the formative writers of pulp mm -hmm. noir fiction, mm -hmm. crime fiction. Um, who lived in San Francisco, which is one of the inspirations for that, that I walk the streets that he writes about and all these characters are, um, you know, living in, you know, in the Tenderloin or at staying at hotels downtown or, and uh, also Paul Oster, who many years later was writing in New York where I grew up. And I also walked the streets of all his characters and went to all the places where his characters sat on park benches and talked to people and 
Um, so it started out with this connection with these writers and these places. And then I gave myself a lot of really strange and interesting assignments. Like I would take um, a character's name and all of their aliases. Because if they were, you know, let's say a criminal or a detective. And I would map those names onto pitches and notes. Like really? Sam Spade equals these notes. So and so equals these notes. Okay. And then I would create like a, a complex of pitches and make a melody out of that. Or okay. sometimes there would be a phone number that kept repeating in a story where someone wasn't answering and then it would be on this street and I would take those numbers and distill them into a series of rhythms. Um, and that would become a groove or a bass line mm. or something. So I did all these strange things I've actually never done before with this project because I was trying to figure out if the stories would help me score them mm. just by giving me clues. So I kind of treated <laughs> all these random things as clues and then I kind of mapped them into musical information and saw what happened. So it made me write really differently and I went down all these strange rabbit holes trying to figure that out. Well, that's interesting because, you know, my <laughs> first impression was I saw Von Noir, so I thought, oh, film noir, right? right. I, and I know you've worked with a lot of films, so I was exactly. making this association, but that's completely different than what I thought. Right, it's all books. It's all, it's all books. books. And that people have actually asked me, are you going to do film with this? And I was like, no, this is the film in your head. <laughs> this is like, this is exactly the film that you hear, that you see when you're listening to this, or when you're thinking about the characters as I described them, or a walk a person took that evoked these memories or gave them this information. So yeah. I do a lot of projects with film, it's true. Right, I was um, going to ask you. But this one's kind yeah. of about the film that plays in your mind and right. the music in a way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wow, okay. Yeah. So, completely different approach than, say, when you approach music that will accompany film or is inspired exactly. by film. Exactly. This yeah. probably will, st it is cinematic music in a way, yeah. but it's not for any film we've seen. That's great. <laughs> I guess, yeah. Yeah. And it really comes from the, the stories. It's like really fun, nerdy stuff that I dug up. Um, yeah. Not so much about, you know, not trying to sound like Hollywood film soundtracks, which have their gorgeous own amazing. Right. Um, sound and orchestral qualities. Um, it's not about the red lipstick and the trench coat. It's kind of this nerdy process oriented mm. with the ways that writers tell these stories and mm -hmm. get us into characters' heads and mm. get us connected to a street corner, all these little kinds of hints that I was trying to figure out how to make into a... So it's inspired by the nuance of the written word by these authors. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. talking yeah. about these stories of, of that time period, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, and hopefully it's really fun too because I try to give the musicians ways of also feeling like they're part of solving a crime or solving something. So we have a lot of choice and games and structures yeah. and clues and right. things that we can do to cue each other. Um, and I kind of create scenarios where it's not all solved for them. I kind of want us to solve it together. So mm -hmm. that's another crazy thing in my mind of wrestling with mm -hmm. is how much should I solve and how much should I leave open. But luckily, since these are all like detective stories, right. I'm just kind of, we rehearse trying to solve them together. We don't really know how it's going to come out. So when you say solve, do, does that mean you've left room for free improvisation to take hold and become? Yeah, absolutely. Free improvisation, but also how we use what I composed. Mm -hmm. So um, one kind of good example that's really a hard piece that we're still trying to wrestle with, but I'm <laughs> so excited by where it's gone so far, is uh, there's a scene in a bar in North Beach from a Dashiell Hammett story. And when he told, well, this is from The Big Knockover, which is a really great story about a double bank heist on Montgomery Street. And uh, the night before the heist, the detective, the Continental Op, he notices in this bar, like, all these famous characters who are gangsters from all over the country. And they all have these fantastic names, like Sheenie Holmes and Happy Jim Hacker and Angel Grease Cardigan. Like, they're the most incredible, ridiculous names. <laughs> and so I wanted to score this bar scene. And so I made a theme for all of these different personalities. And the musicians all have the themes and we learn all of them. But at any given moment, you could play a theme with somebody else and kind of have a conversation like you would in a bar, or you could decide to play a, theme, a different theme. So it's kind of like we have a lot of choice. There's maybe six different characters that you could be at any given time. And maybe four of us decide to all be Happy Jim Hacker together and we really play that theme. Or it could be somebody else's Sheeny Holmes and he's doing his little thing. And they're all kind of coming in out of focus the way a conversation would in a bar. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a lot of choice, but everyone has to learn everything mm -hmm. in a way. And then we'll see, like, I'll be like, we'll go to the bar, and we go in, and we see what happens and how we get out. Wow, so, so, so it's very interactive. Super, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not necessarily set scenes. It's The scenes can change. Yeah, exactly. You know? or each scene has its own kind of logic or something like that. Right, with some variation on it, right? Yeah, exactly. Where I've left things unsolved so that we can 
listen and solve it that way. So how, how many books do you think you've read to create this project? <laughs> this is a lot. I had to read a lot to distill it down to the ones that I knew were like, oh, this one's going to be a juicy one. So mm. um, a few, I, I boil it down to a few Dashiell Hammett stories and a, and a couple of Paul Auster mm. stories that I really went deep into. Are they, are there, is there a continuity or are they, or are they like vignette, vignettes, like it seems, each piece is a scene and it, it doesn't necessarily connect to itself per se or? Yeah, it kind of feels like a suite in two parts, like mm -hmm. there's like the Hammett suite and then the Oster suite in a way, because some of them are really like a character, Big Flora is this great character in this Dashiell Hammett story, she's like this tough broad who, uh, there's a scene where she's got like a cigarette hanging from the corner of her mouth and she's pulling a bullet out of her guy in the hideout and... And she's like the kind of woman you don't mess with. She masterminds this whole thing. So I thought she needed a theme song. Like she's, she's yeah, serious. You know? Right. So Big Flora has her own ballad. And the whole piece is just kind of devoted a little bit to her personality. you know. And then one will be the bar scene and mm -hmm. for the Maltese Falcon, which I kind of felt like we had to do because it's so famous. Um, mm -hmm. We uh, we have a, there's a famous scene from the book and the film where you know, um, Humphrey Bogart, uh, his character, Sam Spade, is... In there with Casper Gutman, the, this big gangster guy who's totally gross and slimy, and they're in this hotel room, and he gets uh, slipped a Mickey, and uh, he wakes up, you know, the next day, and they've disoriented him. So there's this scene where we're in the hotel room together, the musicians, and there's all these ways you can deal with that sinister relationship. Hmm. Um, so those are just wow. some examples of my strange way of composing <laughs> for this project. No, I think that's yeah, great. You know, yeah. I, well, I had I, a lot of fun. Yeah, I really liked. I liked. I, I really uh, enjoyed that that description. It was. It, it it's really surprising, and I I think that also add to the um, element of surprise for people who come to hear you present this. Yeah. I, it's it's the th the third time I think. Exactly. Yeah, we haven't done this that much, so it still yeah. feels really fresh to us. We don't know what's going to happen in a good right. way. Right. Right. And and you have you have six musicians in the group. Yes. Um. Yeah. It's my. A version of my normal quartet beat and switch, uh, mm -hmm. augmented by Tim Perkis on electronics and mm -hmm. William Wyman on percussion and vibes, but also live Foley like sound effects. So yeah. he's doing a lot of things like shoes on boards and shaking oh, up. Oh, William. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he's doing all these fun things that uh, evoke some of these scenes that we're right. in, which kind of makes it more fun too. And right. And, and you have Tim Perkis, who's an electronic uh, practitioner. So, and um, yeah. How, how, how did you incorporate the electronics, modern electronics element into film noir, which, I mean, sorry, avant-noir, yeah, you know, the, yeah. the, the storyline, which didn't have a lot of electronics in it. I mean, right. conceptually, that's what I'm thinking, um, just from a standard point of view. So how, how was that? Well, in a way, Tim is just, his sounds happen to be these new electronic sounds, but he's like an old soul musician, just the way somebody who plays the piano or saxophone mm. is to me, the way he interacts. Mm. So... Um, his sound world is really great because it adds all this texture and layers and abstraction when we want it. But um, also, we've worked together a lot now, and Tim is amazing because even though he comes from this world where there's rarely a music stand or a score, um, with him we've actually been working on a lot of projects where I have a score for him, and we talk about this section having this sound world or this, and mm -hmm. he's really fantastically open to engaging with like how he could be part of a composition that's more set. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've come so far in communicating that together and figuring out what we do that I was just listening to our last concert today and he really takes all this music to this other level because mm -hmm. of uh, the combination of his ears, his sound palette, and then how he navigates my direction mm -hmm. is totally amazing. So he's yeah. really, really engaged his, 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 uh, his uh, instrument exactly in a, in a melodic contextual way too yeah, along yeah. the lines of with everybody else yeah he's really in the score it's not just oh and then tim do whatever he's right like, which yeah. i hear a lot of you know so that does, does happen yeah you know, well for most of the times people they right. can't imagine engaging but tim's <laughs> like wait i want the full score you just gave right. me I'm like okay you know he, he's really serious he wants to be able to follow along when it's his turn to rest mm -hmm. and he wants to know who he's interacting with when it's time for him to be more active or background or foreground he's right because he's just a great musician it's beyond his instrument you know so right. we're really lucky. It's he really it's fantastic. And wow, yeah. that's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you having coming in and talking with me. It's so great to be part of the festival. Yeah, I'm I'm glad we were able to do this. I, I actually personally wanted to hear this project. <laughs> Thank you for wanting that. You know, so it's also a personal uh, personal uh, interest as well. And I think a lot of people will come now. They'll have a, a stronger sense of the uh, the surprise and awe that this project will inspire. Surprise and awe.
Yeah. Great. Well, thanks. We'll see everybody there. Okay, great.